Greetings. My name is Dr. Lisa Gunderson. In my community, I'm known as Dr. Lisa. To my students, I was known as Dr. G. Thank you again so much for joining me. I wanted you to think about, again, where you are in terms of the territories that we live on, that we work on, and that we have the honor of being able to be here. I am coming to you from the Lekwungen speaking territories of the Esquimalt and Songhees nations. And I will tell you, as I've said before, when I get up in the morning, it is truly humbling to know that I am on land where people have been fighting for a millennia to preserve their way of life, their cultures, their languages, despite the systemic racism that they felt for hundreds of years. We began with, you can't be Switzerland. And today I want to talk about, at the end of that piece, I mentioned certain powers and privileges that we all have. When it comes to the issue of race, here in Canada and in the United States, the area of privilege is going to be white, as some people may say, Caucasian. And so Dr. Robin DiAngelo speaks to something that happens when we're in white space, that there is, for some people, a degree of stress that occurs when issues of race come up. And this is true in counseling as well especially because many counselors have been trained to not see color. I don't use the term colorblind because it's ableistic. I like to think of it more as um, color erasure that occurs um, or being color evasive, racially evasive, uh, racial erasure. You cannot fight racism if you can't acknowledge race. We know race is not a biological concept. It is a sociopolitical one that has real mental wellness consequences, real physical health consequences, real sociopolitical consequences, right? So when you have a state in which even a minimum amount of racial stress becomes intolerable, it triggers a range of defensive moves. So think if you've seen this or heard it to yourself or thought it yourself in terms of assumptions that racism is simply personal prejudice, that if I'm a good person, I can't be racist. I'm entitled to remain comfortable. It's unkind to point out racism. And it's important to note that you may see these assumptions across groups. What happens is, White fragility functions has to silence discussions, to close off self-reflections, to focus on the messenger and not the message, to hijack conversations, to maintain white solidarity. And it's important to understand that we're talking about the system of white supremacy. So when you think about when somebody calls you in, what defense mechanisms have you heard, have you used, or have you believed? For example, do you want to say, you don't know me, you're playing the race card. You know what, that wasn't my intention, that's not what I meant. Remember in our previous video clip that you don't have to have negative intention to have discriminatory outcome. Or I've suffered too, don't you know that I was all these other things? I don't feel safe, or I'm not all white people. And what are your rules of engagement? Would you want a client to talk to you about having a proper tone, coming to you with having a proper tone when saying that you may have done something that was racially offensive? Do you want them to do things privately or if you're in class? Do you want it indirectly? Do you want somebody to acknowledge your good intentions first? I know you're a nice person. I, I want you to know that before launching in. 
Do you want to be allowed time to explain yourself versus just listening, accepting, apologizing, and then? Or do you prefer people not to give you feedback at all? For Ibok persons, indigenous, black, persons of African ancestry, persons of Asian ancestries, persons of Latinx ancestries, right? Persons of indigenous ancestries. Many things can happen when engaged with dealing with fragility, dealing with racial microaggressions. And they include things like, did what I think really happen happen? Was it an intentional or unintentional slight that the teacher did, the other counselor did, that my counselor did? If I confront them, what will be the consequences? These are real questions that end up circling through Ibak person's minds when these things occur. And it becomes exhausting. It's called racial battle fatigue. And so we really want to understand that when we're in sessions with persons and maybe they're sharing racialized violence incidences, that these are some of the questions that operate in the mind. You see, you can't disrupt the system of oppression or understand how systems of oppression work until you come to terms with how they've worked on you. That's Trisha Ibarria. And it's so important that you engage in doing your own internal work. Make no mistake, these are issues that go across our different racial spaces, across our different ism spaces. We all have internal work that we must do. When it comes to being part of the dominant group, having the power and privilege, you indeed have an obligation to engage in seeing how this works. Because again, we all have it within us, but how does that racism, for example, manifest in you? How does it impact your profession, you professionally and personally? There are many ways that you're gonna be able to help and find resources. A simple Google search can begin to help with that process. So I'm going to end with just a couple of things. Think to yourself, what does it mean to be white in this society? What is your relationship to power in society, in school, in your classroom? This was from an educator. So think about this. What does that mean in the counseling room? What does it mean when we're on the job or in part of an activity? How can you imagine different ways of being white that are more aligned with racial justice, both in the counseling room and more generally. And for Ibok persons, we need to be thinking about as well, making sure we're not minimizing real racialized violence that can be occurring because people have gotten so used to it happening that they begin to minimize it themselves. We want to make sure we create spaces to take care of ourselves when having to deal with issues of white fragility. To care for ourselves, to make sure that we have self-care ways that make sense to us and also for our clients as well. Critically important. So I want to remind everyone that while this may feel overwhelming, to just have some faith, take that first step in faith. You don't have to see the whole staircase. You just got to take that first step. Towards that, I am going to show you one piece that might be able to be somewhat helpful in understanding how counseling and racism occur. The American Counseling Association has a whole series of journal articles dealing with these issues. ABCI Toronto is a wonderful, again, example, Association of Black Psychologists, but it gives you information around things like African-centered Black psychology and other groups have this as well. 
you just need to do some researching with others, right? Engage in learning and understanding because when you made the decision to become a disruptor, a dismantler, a abolitionist in terms of being an anti-racist counselor, it means that you're gonna engage in your time to learn the things that you haven't learned and that you don't know. I want to thank you for taking time to listen today. I so appreciate it. And again, even though it may feel overwhelming, remember, all you have to do is take that first step. You already have. I hope you have a wonderful day.